And next speaker today is John Hubbard from Cardinal, who will give an expository lecture on one dimension of the Yes, yeah, so you see, there's nothing like giving a lecture on a subject where you're supposed to give an expository subject about something that you've been talk working on for 15 years. And where, moreover, uh, many experts in the field are sitting in the audience, uh, all of whom will take offense at your, forget at your omitting any of their work. Uh, and just even mentioning their names would take up a substantial part of the uh, lecture. And, um, and then one sees other people who I believe are probably not experts in this field. So, let's try to make a convention. I am going to try my very best to speak to the non-experts. And, uh, you know, one has a natural tendency to look at the friendly faces. And then when they nod or look bored, you go faster. You people are in charge of stopping me when this happens. Uh, you know, I mean, it's instinctive. It's just impossible to avoid. I mean, after all, they already know everything that I have to say. So, we are talking about holomorphic dynamics. In one dimension. In practice, this means take an analytic function f of z and look at sequences z, z naught, z1 is equal to f of z naught, z2 is equal to f of z1, dot, dot, dot. Now, I cannot possibly uh, take the time to explain why this is an interesting problem. Uh, I, I must start with the assumption that people want to understand how such sequences behave. So the question that I am going to ask is how do such sequences behave? And I have to start with the assumption that people know why they're interested in that. The reason for which I am taking the restriction to holomorphic and in one dimension is because this really represents one of the success stories of mathematics of the last 20 or 30 years where the subject has ha had an enormous amount of, pro of progress and a great many of the problems which were completely open, just completely unapproachable 20 years ago are now completely solved, which doesn't mean that we don't have plenty of new problems to work on, but we, uh, many of the older problems are now actually very thoroughly understood. These are, of course, mappings from the plane into the plane, but I want to emphasize the word holomorphic. If you were to t remove that and just take differentiable maps from R2 to R2, it would be absolutely wrong to claim that we have any sort of a success story to, to report. Virtually nothing is understood. If you were to remove uh, the... the <laughs> you see? You see, I'm already running into the problems of complaints and difficulties. Um, excuse me? I will, perhaps. Uh, so, let me give a vague outline of the situations in which one encounters these problems. There is first a local theory.
And what that means is that you take a function f of z is equal to lambda z plus higher degree terms, so the f of zero is equal to zero. And you completely for you ask, what happens near zero? And let's give grades of the, out of ten to the way to the extent to which this subject these subjects are understood. This one I will give a grade of nine out of ten. Then there is iterating polynomials. And say in degree two, and there I think I would give a grade of perhaps still nine out of ten. Let me write uh, in the dynamical plane. Now let's try the same thing in degree d bigger than 2. I'm afraid my grade goes down drastically to perhaps 5 out of 10. Then you could try iterating something besides polynomials, iterating uh, rational functions. And perhaps we should start again in degree two. And I don't know, four out of 10, three out of 10, figures go down. And then in degree d greater than two, three out of 10 maybe, we're down quite a bit. Then there, there are the problems of understanding the parameter spaces. Well, for polynomials of degree two, which really corresponds to the study of the Mandelbrot set, I think we can honestly still give a nine out of 10 here. There's only one question left open. <laughs> Only one. <laughs> and then there's, uh, if polynomials of degree three, maybe, perhaps one could go so far as a six. Higher degree, perhaps zero. I don't know, something like, oh, I guess we can, we can give an honest two there. Then there's, there's a lot more. There's uh, entire functions. Their parameter spaces. I don't even know how to how to give grades to these things because those things that have been studied have often been studied successfully, but there isn't much that has been studied. It's also much less clear where entire functions are concerned, which ones should be studied. This is just one possible approach to the subject that one might take. There are completely different subjects. This is, so to speak, the example theoretic view. Which examples are we going to study? There's also the point of view of techniques. And there, I really think, because I am fundamentally an examples person, the way I always think about things is by trying to understand specific cases. This is the organization which strikes me as natural. But for other people, Sullivan, for instance. Sullivan claims that, it, that all examples just slow down understanding theories. Uh, for other people, this is a very unnatural way of organizing the subject. So let me, let me put in a pitch for Sullivan's view here. And there, I think, one can say there are local conjugacies
which go back virtually forever. Then there are small divisor techniques Then there are quasi-conformal mappings. There are Teichmuller theory. There are uh, puzzles, and there is renormalization theory. And I think it is fair to say that virtually every technique used in holomorphic dynamics falls into one of these categories. What about, uh, what about smooth ergodic theory? Okay. Uh, there are, there is, it's not fair to say, but it's my view in any case, that almost all the theorems come from one of these fields. Uh, it's remarkable that these two go back to the period from 1870 to, well, no, this one goes back to the 1870 through 1920, perhaps. This one goes back exactly to 1942. And everything since then is after 1980. I would like to, from, a, from the point of view of the progress of the theory, there is no doubt that the introduction of quasi-conformal mappings into the subject by Sullivan marks the rebirth of the subject and the beginning of the modern era in, in this field. It is undoubtedly the most important thing that happened to the field uh, since the, the early days that I don't know anything really much about. So, so there's enough here to talk for, for the next two weeks, for the next month, for longer. Jack, why don't you make a choice? What should I cho what should I talk about? <laughs> make a cho make a choice. Tell me something to talk about. I mean, I can start at the beginning, and if so, I will never get to the end. I could start here. I could start here. I could start there. Talk about the Mandelbrot set and quasi-conformal mappings. The Mandelbrot set and quasi-conformal mappings. Okay. 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 No, I'll tell you, the reason for which I'm lecturing like this freehand rather than with my transparencies is that I started at the beginning and it looked to me as if I was never going to get anywhere. So let's, let's follow your advice and start with the Mandelbrot set and, uh, and quasi-conformal mapping. That's the problem with ever erasing these things with... The only thing that's counterproductive is ever using, pay, using water. Is there still any, is there still any water? I'll wash the... Uh, I'll wash. Well, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> I can figure out how to do this. So, I guess there's a third point of view for this, which is the appearance of the following picture. Which I'm sure, from the point of view of the popular introduction to this subject, was probably the most important event.
this picture. This thing doesn't operate that. <laughs> oh. So everyone, I am sure, has seen these picture, this picture an enormous number of times. But let me talk about this picture a bit anyway. This picture, one of the reasons for which it is so immensely popular, is that it is so very, very easy to draw. It's specified by the following program. Choose C in the complex numbers. Consider the sequence C c squared plus c, c squared plus c, the whole thing squared plus c, etc. And uh, color c according to the number of the first term with absolute value Uh, greater than, oh, whatever, 10 maybe. So you take this, you take a specific dot, this one here, that's a number C. You look at this sequence, C, C squared plus C, C squared plus C, the whole thing squared plus C, and so forth. You look at these successive numbers, and maybe you put yourself some upper bound, like a thousand. If up to a thousand moves, You've never, the, the number has never got bigger than 10. You leave the point in black. And if the 73rd got big, well, you color in number 73. It's a color by number, just like all color by numbers. It's a complicated set, this thing. Here's a blow up. I w didn't really come prepared for a, for a color, uh, for a picture show, though it's quite easy to make pretty picture shows out of this. But uh, th this just gives you an idea of what this little region up here looks like. Now, what? It seems the metal brush has since been burned into the. You remove it. Is there another piece of transparency on the screen? Remove your transparency to see. It's burnt into the screen? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to tell Mandelbrot about this. He will find it natural. <laughs> there is no doubt that the appearance of these pictures is what started the popularity of the subject and is still probably the main part of the popularity. Of course, this program is very simple, but lots and lots of programs are simple, and it is important to understand why this one is important. This one is important because this is the natural picture to make in the parameter space of quadratic polynomials. Now, I'm going to explain this, but I want to, to explain something else before that. In some sense, understanding parameter spaces of dynamical systems has for a very long time been a central problem of mathematics. It certainly, I mean, people have been trying to understand how dynamical systems, whether real physical ones where your parameter consists of turning some, turning some knob or changing the mass of a planet or something, 
to mathematical ones of all sorts and kinds has been a central problem of mathematics for ages. The person though who really brought this to my consciousness was Tom back in the 1960s who clearly focused on the question how do the dynamical how do parameter spaces of dynamical systems behave. He created a subject called the subject of, uh, called catastrophes whose object was in principle precisely that to understand the parameter spaces of dynamical systems. Now, as probably everyone knows, catastrophe theory sort of fell into ill repute. And it fell into ill repute not at all because its problem was not a good one, but because uh, Tom made the assumption he wanted to apply his, uh, his theory to biology, and he thought, well, there's so much friction in any biological system that we might as well suppose that things are living at the minima of their, of, their, uh, of their potential energy. And so rather than trying to understand the bifurcation of dynamical systems, we'll try to understand the bifurcation of minima of functions. And then he managed to do that, but all of his applications were fundamentally flawed, especially his applications to biology, because of course, uh, we know what happens when a biological system is at the minimum of, the potential ed of its potential energy. And, uh, and so that assumption that, that you could make this simplification does not work. Now, why did he make this assumption? Well, he made this assumption because he wasn't able to understand bifurcations of dynamical systems. I mean, he made this assumption because, because he wasn't able to, to study other things. And this tells you why. It's because the bifurcation, di the, the, the parameter space pictures for dynamical systems are immeasurably more complicated than he had imagined. At least I think than he had imagined. Certainly they were immeasurably more complicated than he was able to do anything with at that time. I believe that without the computer pictures of this particular parameter space, we never would have succeeded in saying anything about them. Even though when you look at the papers, the papers often contain no pictures at all and certainly no reference to computers. I believe that without these computers to guide us at every level, we never would have made any progress whatsoever. Now why is this the natural picture to make in the parameter space of quadratic polynomials? Well, the reason is the following. If you're, under, if you're trying to understand any polynomial P, the, natural, uh, this, this, the main thing to understand when you're iterating a polynomial is that some of these sequences, Z0, Z1 is equal to P of Z0, Z2 is equal to P of Z1, and so forth, are extremely easy to understand. Namely, they're those that tend to infinity. If you start any place that's big, the next time it will be much bigger, and the time after that it will be much bigger again. I mean, take, I don't know, z squared plus 1, and start at uh, 4, and then 4 squared plus 1 is 17, and 17 squared plus 1 is whatever it is, and I don't know the square of 17 by heart, and so forth. But it's clear that wherever you start, th the polynomial will make you much bigger if you start at some place big. Infinity is an attractive, and in fact an extremely attractive fixed point. So it's very natural to concentrate on the set Kp is the set of Z such that if you iterate the polynomial, you do not tend to infinity. This will be some compact subset of the plane, of which I have a couple of examples here. Here's, a, here's an example of an especially nice set Kp. Hey, Mandelbrot's back there again. <laughs> I don't understand that. <laughs> so, here is an example of what such a set KP might look like. Others, some complicated filiform something or other. And everything else goes off to infinity.
Then, if P is quadratic, in which case it can always be written in the form z squared plus c, it is then true that there is a dichotomy. Either kp is connected, and that occurs if and only if 0 is in kp, which is another way of saying if and only if c is in m, if it's one of those black points of the Mandelbrot set. Or K sub P is totally disconnected. Which occurs if and only if C is not in M. Thus, what I'm saying is that the most important question that you can ask about a polynomial, the most important object that you can devise, you can think of if you want to think of a polynomial as a dynamical system is the set KP. And the most important question that you can ask about it is, is it connected or not? And the sense in which the Mendelbrot set is the natural drawing in the parameter space for quadratic polynomials is that it answers that question. If C is in the Mandelbrot set, the corresponding polynomial, for the corresponding polynomial KP is connected, and if C is not in the Mandelbrot set, then it isn't. Actually, there's a great deal more to, to say, and I want to give you a hint of can M be understood? Can KP be understood. And the reason for which I had given grades of 9 out of 10 to, these particu to those particular subjects is because the answer to both of these questions is almost yes. So let me try to outline what it means to understand KP. That means, for instance, that this rather complicated locus can be understood. It can be understood in the sense that you can give a name to every individual dot and say exactly how that dot, how that name determines the dynamics of the polynomial completely. Uh, it's, it's a sort of absolutely complete total answer to the question that you would, would, would think when you look at something as complicated as that. You would think that it was absolutely hopeless that you could answer a question like that. In fact, there are plenty of people who, when they, when they first saw pictures of this sort, declared this chaotic. And I'm convinced that when they invented this name, they did not mean chaotic dynamics in any technical sense. They meant this is just incomprehensible, too, comp too complicated for the human mind. That has turned out to be absolutely wrong. These things, at least, we can understand completely. So let me give you an instance of this. There's a polynomial with a Julia set a little bit like this one, but not quite, which is the polynomial z squared plus i. I is sitting just about there. And z squared plus i, there's a picture like the one that I showed you a minute ago, which looks roughly speaking like this. And it has all kinds of these little curly cues. And see, 0 is here, i is here. Minus 1 plus i is there. Minus i is here. And I invite you to verify that in, under this, under this poly polynomial, 0 maps to i, maps to minus 1 plus i, maps to minus i, maps back to minus 1 plus i. So it would be better to represent it like this. 
that after one bounce it repeats. I would also like to invite you to observe that if you take the rational number 1, 6 and you write it in base 2, it gets written in base 2, point O, O1, which repeats. Point O, O1, 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 O1 is 1, 6 as written in base 2. And the similarity between these things is that after one bounce, things repeat with period two. There are deeper similarities in that one, but that one will be enough for the time being. Now, out of this number one six, I'm going to build, I'm going to build this Julia set out of the number one six as follows. Take a circle, and I will mark it like a clock. Here you'll observe is 1, 6. And 1, 6 has two half angles. Here, let's use, use this beautiful colored chalk that was so kindly provided. One twelfth and seven twelfths. Let's call this side A. Oh, by the way, these two numbers are the two halves of one six. Twice one twelfth is one six six, and twice seven twelfths is one six two, as counted by angles. Uh, it's fourteen twelfths, but twelve twelfths is a whole turn and doesn't count. Let's call this side A and this side B. And given a number theta, let me call it t maybe, some t someplace, I will associate to t its symbol, sigma sub 1, 6 of t, is equal to something like a, a, b, a, b, b, something like that, which will be the kth entry This represents the half circle in which theta, 2 theta, 4 theta, 8 theta, etc. is to be found. So you take your number t, it's in A, you double it, you're still in A, you double it again, you're in B, you double it again, you're in B again. That isn't the symbol of that particular point T. But it's a symbol of some point or other. Here's what you can do on the level of just pure dynamics. Now let me tell you what you can do on the level of, uh, of pure combinatorics. Now here's what you can do on the level of dynamics. You can take this complicated object and you can charge it. You build it out of wire. You comb your hair a few times. You put it down on top of your, onto your, your Julia set. And the electrons will run wherever they want to go, always preferring the sort of pointy points places to the, uh, to the uh, to, to the inner points. And once it's charged, you will create on the outside an electrical field which, who's, which will have equipotential curves, something like this. And which will have force lines, something like this. Every 
one of these force lines will go off to infinity and will go off to infinity in a particular direction. This one, for instance, will go off to in infinity in the horizontal direction. I will measure my angles from here and I will count them in turns. So over here is something that goes off to, the, to infinity in the, the direction, the negative real direction, negative horizontal direction, and so forth. Notice that that allows you to give a name to every dot. The name of any dot is the angle from which it is seen from infinity. It's the, if you start at that dot and go off to infinity in the direction of a force line, then you will go off to infinity at some particular angle. That's the name of this dot. And now the theorem. There's a really remarkable theorem which relates this description to this description, which says the force, li the force lines at angles T1 and T2 land at the same point if and only if sigma sub 1 6 of T1 is equal to sigma sub 1 6 of T2. So we know exactly what is identified what is identified by which angles lead to, lead to rays which come down exactly to the same point. Now, that theorem is true having cut the circle at the two halves, uh, at the two halves of one six. If instead you had cut the circle at the two halves of 19 40 thirds, then you would get this picture. 1743rds, I'm sorry. If you cut the circle at the two halves of 1743rds, you would get this picture. And more generally, if you change this 1, 6 to run through any old, through all the angles, you will get essentially all of the possible Julia sets. All of these sets, Kp, will be created by exactly the same structure as this. Now at this point, if I were giving a popular lecture, I would just assert that this was true. But unfortunately, we have in our audience large numbers of genuine mathematicians who have spent their lives focusing on the fact that this statement is wrong. So we have to come. This is a great success story. Huh? We have succeeded for lots and lots of these complicated fractal objects. We have a complete description of their, ge of their topology, of exactly how to make them by taking these circles and identifying certain points of them. For lots and lots, for almost all, we have a complete description of them. But of course, being mathematicians, what we tend to do is to focus on the others that we haven't understood yet. So it doesn't seem quite so great a success story for, seen from that point of view as it might. When does this work? This works when KP is connected and locally connected. Connected, I suppose that everybody knows what connected means. Locally connected is a subject that you get really interested in if you want to go into to, uh, holomorphic dynamics. Let me give just some examples of what a non-locally connected space is. Here is a very standard one. This space is not locally connected. If you take this point, it doesn't have any small connected neighborhoods. 
when you take a small connected, a small neighborhood of it, what you always see is just lots and lots of vertical lines that can't be connected to each other. This set is for the same region, region, reason not locally connected. And there is a theorem which asserts the mapping e to the 2 pi i theta z plus z squared is not locally connected when now the when is something really amazingly complicated you begin by saying that theta is irrational and if it is irrational there's something which ought to be learned in high, taught in high school because it's so much fun, but it usually isn't, which consists of saying that you can write theta as equal to 1 over a1 plus 1 over a2 plus 1 over a3 plus 1 over and so forth, called continued fractions. And if you stop at some particular stage, you, you find a number which is very close to theta, a sequence of approximations p1 over q1, p2 over q2, p3 over q3, and so forth. For instance, you would find that the square root of 5 minus 1 over 2 is approximated by uh, uh, 1, let me see, uh, well in any case there's a 5 thirds, there's an 8 fifths, there's a 13 eighths, and so forth where at each stage you get this number by repeating that one and this one by adding those two. Something called Fibonacci numbers. There's a, there's a world of entertainment in learning about continued fractions which I certainly cannot teach about now. And amazingly enough, the exact sharp condition, well it's a sharp condition for something, it implies that the thing is not locally connected, is if sigma log of qn plus 1 over qn uh, is uh, divergent. So this happens. There are numbers like that. For these, the scheme that I have suggested to draw the Julia sets does not work. I wish I could sit down and sort of sketch for you why it doesn't work, because after all, there's nothing impossible about drawing, or at least approximately drawing, non-locally connected sets. But unfortunately, I can't. And anybody who wants to go to work on this, I mean, it's a good idea. We have no idea what these Julia sets look like. There's no approximate sketch of how such a, what such a Julia set looks like. There's no I cannot sort of sketch where you see it sort of looks like this and then you have to add in some curly cues here and then you keep repeating curly cues or something like that. I just can't do it. I don't know what they look like at all. We don't have any idea what they look like. There, there's another problem which I think really is worthy of, cons of a great deal of attention. Recently, uh, Sebastian van Strien has come up with examples of polynomials of high degree for which the Julia sets are of positive measure. I'm not absolutely convinced that paper is right, but it certainly sort of brings out the point that it might well be. But I am convinced that for such numbers, for such numbers, the Julia sets may well be of positive area. If anybody asks me to take a bet, I'll take a bet that for all such numbers the Julia set is of positive area. And in particular, that generically for polynomials with a fixed point with derivative of absolute value 1, the Julia set has positive area. This is based on 
I have a heuristic argument which might conceivably indicate this. But I'm convinced that one should be able to make computer experiments which would say something significant about this. Especially now that computers go so much faster, computer experiments about these things used to be tremendously difficult, but I think that they are now probably accessible. Okay, so there's at least one problem that, deser that deserves to be studied. On the other hand, for polynomials of degree 2, we know lots for which the Julia set is locally connected due to the work of Yokoz. Yokoz found a simply marvelous trick to show that quantities and quantities of Julia sets of quadratic polynomials are locally connected. And more specifically, he showed that this is true unless this is true unless the polynomial is infinitely renormalizable. Now what does that mean? I can find a Julia set for which, well, I can find a polynomial such that the Julia set will look something like this. This is not being drawn at random. What I really ought to have is a nice computer picture for you, but maybe you'd find even a handmade picture approximately convincing. Where, if you look at this region. This region maps to this region, which maps to this region, which maps to this region, which after four iterates comes back to itself. So you see, here have a certain u prime, a certain u, and the polynomial iterated four times and restricted to u prime maps u prime to u, but it maps, uh, and u prime is contained and relatively compact in u. And this mapping is proper, meaning that it maps the boundary to the boundary. Now that means that you can renormalize it once. You can focus your attention on here, and you'll see another little polynomial inside. Now you might wonder, let's blow this up and maybe we'll see something something where again, perhaps using the 17th iterate, after 17 iterates it will map outside itself again. Then looking inside here at the 17th iterate, you might see the same sort of behavior again and again and again and again, or of course you might not. If you do, that's what's called infinitely renormalizable. And for all polynomials, uh, is infinitely renormalizable or has a non-linearizable uh, indifferent periodic point, I should have put this in. For all polynomials except these, the Julia set is locally connected. Now, this is true for z squared plus c, but there's an absolute scandal which says for, poly for polynomials z cubed plus c, we don't know anything. Okay, well, 
Uh, it just, it just has, a, uh, has an indifferent periodic point. How about that? Yes, absolutely. There are cases, of course, where it has a... Yes, I'm sorry. It is simply scandalous that for polynomials of the form z cubed plus c, never, never mind z to the 17th plus c, we know essentially nothing. When you look at computer pictures, they look practically the same. There's a bifurcation locus, which looks practically the same. Of course, all the details are different. But you don't see any reason from looking at these pictures why things should be really qualitatively different. And you know, Yokoza's argument depends on the number two. As soon as you have two critical points or a double critical point as for z cubed plus c, the argument doesn't work. In the boundary of the bifurcation locus for these, we only know countably many period, uh, polynomials for which we know that the Julia set is locally connected. For the vast majority, we don't know anything. In fact, for all polynomials of higher degree, we don't know anything. Much more than what? Much more than Oh, yes, I suppose that you can get much more than countably many. You can take those for which the, the critical point is non-recurrent and not persistently recurrent. But still, fundamentally, fundamentally, the, the wonderful argument which Yoko's found does not work. And I think an absolutely central challenge in this field is figuring out a substitute. Figuring out how to make it work if, it, if it's at all possible. Figuring out how and what essential way it fails if it fails. I mean, maybe it's just wrong. Maybe there are lots of these non-locally connected Julia sets out there for these cubic polynomials. It would be really nice to know. Certainly the computer doesn't seem to indicate it's true, but who knows? So now I've spent long enough talking about the failures of the subject. Let's talk about some more success stories. Can one understand the Mandelbrot set itself? Uh, essentially, everything goes through exactly the same way for, uh, for z cubed plus c as for z squared plus c, except that you have to switch uh, writing numbers in base 2 to writing numbers in base 3. Everything that you can say about rational numbers goes through exactly on the nose without any dif difference. And all the truly analytical statements which depend on irrational numbers are just not known. Well, that isn't quite true, as Misha was pointing out. I'm overly pessimistic. But the really, the, the things which allow us to nail things for the Mandelbrot set simply do not go through. Now, how about understanding M? So, you can't really hope to come to a lecture of mine without seeing this happen. I mean, I'm afraid that this is just part of the tradition. For one thing, it's a lot of fun to draw pictures of the Mandelbrot set on the board. Oh, let's put up this one so that you, you can just check me. You can check that nothing that I'm drawing is at random.
You think the Hausdorff dimension is too small? Well, maybe. In any case, if you charge this, if you charge it and you create a field, I won't draw the equipotentials, but I will start drawing in some field lines, just as before there are field lines, and there's something rather amazing that happens. That at all the points which look kind of surprising, as if something is happening, the angle of the force line which lands at that, that point is rational. For instance, here's zero. Here is one half. Nobody's going to be surprised at that. Here is one quarter. Here is three quarters. I won't write it in. And maybe I will put this one in in a different color. Here is one third. Here is two thirds. Here is one seventh. Here is two sevenths. Here is three sevenths. Here is four sevenths. Here is five sevenths. Here is six sevenths. Here is one fifteenth. Here is two fifteenths. Here there's a pretty little Mandelbrot set. I'm not making it up. You can see it right there. Oh, there it is, right up there. I'm not making it up. Here is the one which comes in at 3 fifteenths. And here is 4 fifteenths. And here is 5 fifteenths. No, it isn't. This is 6 fifteenths. 5 fifteenths is one third. I'd already drawn it. Uh, here is 7 fifteenths. and so forth. And here, right here, let's, let's bring it out in some more vivid color. There aren't any more vivid colors. Right here is I, which is at the end of the ray at angle 1, 6. Now, this picture somehow represents my idea of what the success of holomorphic dynamics in one variable has been. There is an extraordinary numerology, or at least a numerology which seems extraordinary the first time you see it, which says that for any angle t, the ray, the force line at angle t, lands at a point of the man boundary of the Mandelbrot set, where the dynamics, the dynamics of that polynomial at the end, reflects the digits of t written in base 2. And I've already given you an example of this. If you take 1, 6, 1, 6 as written in base 2 is written as 0, 0, 1, which repeats, whereas under the iteration of z squared plus i, 0 maps to i maps to minus 1 plus i maps to minus i, which maps back. The digits after one bounce repeat with period 2. And the dynamics after one bounce repeats with, repeats with period 2. Thus, well, and there's a whole bunch more numerology that one can find. For instance, in this region, the polynomial has an attractive periodic point of period 2. And what do you know? One third, when written in base 2, is point 0.01, which repeats. It repeats with period 2. Inside here, you have an attractive cycle of period 3. And what do you know? One seventh, when written in, period ba in base 2, is 0 0.001, which repeats, whereas 2 sevenths is 0 0.010, which repeats. And this guy has sevenths too, but this po po these polynomials, there's also an attractive cycle of period 3 in there. And this number 15 is 15 because it's 2 to the 4th minus 1. And inside here, there's a periodic point of period 4. And I'm sure you would have no trouble telling me what this angle is. Let's take somebody who doesn't know anything about dynamics, who is, would like to guess what that polynomial is, what that angle is. No? Let me find a non-mathematician here. In any case, this is 5, this is 2 to the 5th minus 1, which is 132nd, 131st. I'm sure you would guess. So, 
There's a sense here in which I have completely described the Mandelbrot set. At least, if you believe this business of the numerology, then we know exactly how to build the Mandelbrot set. You take a circle and you squeeze it and you squeeze it and you squeeze it and you squeeze it. You squeeze it at one. You squeeze it by squeezing together one third and two thirds, and then you squeeze it by squeezing together one seventh and two sevenths, and so forth. And by the time you're through doing all your little squeezes and your little squeezes and so forth, you will in fact have constructed the Mandelbrot set. You will have constructed a locus as complicated as this. And I have every reason to believe that this is in fact true. I think. It's in fact correct that this does provide a complete description of the Mandelbrot set. The problem is that it isn't proved. No, it is true if the Mandelbrot set is locally connected, but nobody has succeeded in proving whether the Mandelbrot set is locally connected or not, despite an immense amount of work by Duadi and me originally, and then Yokoz, and more recently, Michal Lubitsch has great contributions in that direction. But, and, uh, and Sullivan has great contributions in that direction. And many other people have great contributions, but it still isn't proved. After all this effort, we still don't know that this technique really works. It's possible that hidden someplace, some little spot, there's some little spot with something rather like this. Actually, the more, the more you look at these things, the more you're able to exclude that anything that you could possibly understand really happens. But, uh, but it still isn't proved. So, at least in this direction, I think that the big... The big... So, let, let me try to outline now what I am saying are the big problems. One problem is trying to understand any Julia set when it's not locally connected. Another tro problem is to try to understand the measure of these Julia sets which are not locally connected. Another one is try to make the Yoko's argument work for polynomials of higher degree, and if you can't, understand why it's failing. Another is finally put the nail in the coffin and prove that the Mandelbrot set is locally connected. It's terribly irritating that we don't seem to be able to do that. And then there's the whole remainder of the world, which is sitting out there. How about trying to understand some spaces of rational functions? Uh, the, since even this, which is the simplest parameter space for dynamical systems at all, is not yet understood, how could we hope to understand any of those? But there's substantial progress due to a number of people, Milner among others, and I'd like to cite my student Jiaxi Luo, who has some wonderful results in that direction also. Uh, then one could try to understand parameter spaces of rational functions in higher dimensions, uh, perhaps try to understand parameter spaces for entire functions, exponentials, for instance. There's a whole world out there of things to be worked on, uh, but really these challenges that are sitting even in the simple problems having to do with quadratic polynomials and cubic polynomials, I think really need to be addressed and they have to be solved before substantial further progress will occur. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>